if the shoe fits. Gender as a social construct and spiders. Gender is constructed by culture and society. So what does that mean? It's a little complicated, so let's start with spiders. Hmm. Okay, there are 3,000 species of spiders in North America. And that's a lot of spiders, right? 3,000 species. Whew. So on the spiders found in North America, there's only a couple that are considered dangerous. It's the Latrodactus species that are really, 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 really bad, right? So an average of four people die a year from spider bites. That's four people out of about, well, now more than this, 328,239,523, whatever it is. So a lot of people, right? There's a lot of people in the United States of America and only four people die on average per year from spider bites. But the deal is, why are we so scared of spiders? If you grew up in the United States, you might remember this nursery rhyme. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. That is kind of a spooky looking spider. But really, why don't we love spiders? So arachnophobia is the fear of spiders. So here's the deal with all that. Spider phobia, arachnophobia, is not like a worldwide kind of common thing. Um, it, it tends to run in families. Uh, psychologists feel like arachnophobia is kind of based on cultural beliefs about the nature of spiders, not necessarily what really is happening with spiders. And lots of cultures consider spiders to be symbols of good fortune. And they're not feared. They're good luck. And in some places in the world, people eat spiders and consider them a delicacy. So, arachnophobia, remember the fear of spiders, constructed by culture and society? And that's what we can do with gender, too. We can say that gender socialization is constructed by society. So right from the second somebody finds out that you're pregnant, what do they ask? Is it a boy or is it a girl? So we are taught to live the way that we are assigned, right? To socially behave in accordance with whether we are a boy or a girl. But today, there's a lot of different ideas about how that's kind of been thrown out. That gender differences are mostly not what you're necessarily born with, but rather how you grow up in your culture. So sex roles are totally biologically assigned, determined, right? It's like you are born with a certain set of stuff and that's considered male or female. That's kind of a steadfast rule, right? But the cultural, the societal construction of gender is a whole different ballgame. So if sex is biologically determined, whether you have a penis or a vulva, all, you know, X, Y chromosomes, all that, gender is culturally determined, meaning you can act certain ways in certain cultures and be considered feminine or masculine. It's a little hard to do now that we're so global, but you get the idea. Because diff different cultures have kind of distinct ideas about what it is to be a female or a male. And those ideas are then how we construct males and females, how we construct how to act like a girl or a woman or act like a boy or a man. And they start really easy. The expectations how you're supposed to act in your gender, how you're supposed to act as a girl or a boy, start right from the beginning or even before the beginning of time, right? They say that it... it the minute, is it a boy or a girl? It starts then. So in utero, 
and and maybe you've experienced this before if you're around someone so what are you having in the girl oh they touch your belly so tenderly oh a girl how sweet a boy oh that's going to be great another one for the team so the deal is based on our socialization and based on how we learn socialization we determine how we're supposed to act how we're supposed to be acting and socialize as a girl or a boy and there's lots of ways we get these cues specifically in this class we talk about some of the main ways of of showing us brainwashing us or whatever you want to say to be to act a certain way and that's family that's peer groups that's schools and the media is really important especially with our connected you know social media society we really have strong ideas how we're supposed to purport ourselves as male or female family this is a christmas card and it's ha ha funny right but I, I think it's interesting what's happening in it is that the males in the family have have all of the power they're in the back and how they they get some peace on earth is they literally duct tape and and tie up their the female members of the family so that young boy the youngest member of the family has more power than his mother who is an adult and his older sister so lots of messages in that right the messages continue. So, um, for example, again, as I was saying, when we look at female infants, um, really, 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 really young, we kind of just we kind of bling them up with the bows and in the soft colors, and we those messages begin for girls that they're more delicate, they're more fragile than boys at this age. Um, an interesting thing, right? That w- that we do it so quickly. This is an example of one of my. Uh, preschool kids that was almost two so not quite preschool her name is Jax and she's just a sturdy sturdy little kid right and would come to school and her mother specifically dressed her in this kind of stuff which I'm not saying you shouldn't have cool clothes because Sacramento's hot in the summer right but look what she's wearing that little strap she had to adjust all the time but she doesn't you know she had to, to be impeded by what she wore what was what was considered feminine and the shoes she has on, they lit up, which is kind of cool. But they're not good running shoes, and she tripped quite a bit. So families really help encourage how to be a girl and how to be a boy. And it's a disadvantage often for girls, as we'll talk about more in this class. Definitely peer groups, right? Peer groups really have a strong influence of what's going on. And I see that all the time in my preschool setting. Like if a boy's not going to do something, then another boy's not going to do something. There, It's just really interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So again, as soon as you can kind of, you know, get an idea how you're supposed to be via your, your peers, uh, kids often change their behavior and that can start pretty, pretty young, you know, pretty, pretty young preschool age for sure. Here's a a perfect example of a couple of my preschoolers, four-year-olds, four-year-old boys. And, you know, so what's wrong with this picture? Let's look at it for a second. Some of you are going to get it already because you already hear my ranting and raving. But the deal is the ringleader in the lower left corner is Hayden. And Hayden hates the colors purple and pink because they're girls' colors. So he's not going to use them. And he is the leader of the pack here. So as you see, the other two boys, who actually Felix the lower right loved, simply loved purple and pink, had no problems with it until he ran into Hayden at preschool and now he hates them too so those are important things and I'm sure you can think of maybe some other examples and and they're simple things maybe but all that builds up to shape as to what is a, what's the value of a girl and the value of a boy right for these colors the purple and pink because they're girl colors they are not as valuable as the other colors in this little manipulative set here uh, Margaret Mead fabulous um, cultural anthropology said it long long ago and just it's that whole little slide that photo I just showed you of the value of girls and boys that many societies have educated their male children on the simple device of teaching them how not to be female because that's a negative thing that's a lesser than thing so those messages are just front and center now too you know didn't happen way back in just ancient civilizations um, this is a, a, a teaching uh, journal, and there's something really wrong with this. Besides the fact that that mo- a lot, of, it's gotten better, but a lot of teaching journals and and that a lot of our media shows mostly white kids when they're talking about kids. So that's gotten better, but that this isn't certainly one of them. But that wasn't what I was talking about. I'm talking about the the gender messages in this 
this uh, magazine. That's for educators, and and it's it's pretty easy to see that the boy is doing and the girl is watching the boy doing. Now, should girls never watch what boys do? Heck no, that's not what I'm saying. But these kinds of, of messages to girls and boys are replicated throughout media, throughout our society, which gives the message to both girls and boys that boys have more power. And you can see this all over the place. I could walk around and give you a million examples of this. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be some, but if it's just the overriding message, what kind of messages are, are we sending to our kids? And this is just a sports catalog that I picked up, just kind of reminded me of that, that cover. And obviously what? So the guy, I mean, they were advertising some cool, like pretty okay rain jackets, right? But the guy with his binoculars is looking off and go, oh, what is he? I mean, he could be looking at a, a bald eagle for all I know. And we have a lot of them up here, and they're stunning every time I see them. But the woman is even looking at what the guy's looking at, right? She's looking at the guy looking at something. Again, replicated all over in, in our, um, our society, given the idea that female stuff is, you know, not as great, not as cool as male stuff. And, and I say it every time. It's, this isn't just a message for girls. Um, it's a message for boys, too, and for males, because it's a bum deal what we expect males to do, right? Just an a example for my, free, my preschool. Free school. It's not free. Um, it's that we do dance party we, uh, pretty much every morning. And my group this, this school year is actually really kind of kicking butt in that, that respect, and boys are – are kind of pitching more. So things are, are changing, but so I don't, nobody has to dance. They, they can if they want. But if you look in this picture, you'll see three girls kind of dancing uh, with scarves, and then you'll see four boys kind of in the, in the background just electing to kind of park it, just sit and, and not dance, which you get that choice. But it's just so interesting, the, the delineation of who's doing it, the girls versus the boys. And if you look, the boys back there, they're looking a little on the, the grumpy side, like, oh, gosh, this is such a drag that we have to sit here while they're doing this. So perhaps one of them sat over there, and then, again, peer pressure made the other one sit over there. And it looks like they're, like, having a time out, which of course they're not. I don't. I don't do that. But so interesting to see this kind of thing. So peers really, really, really help influence how you're going to move around um, as a male or female in our society. It starts pretty young. There's a th three year old, couple three year olds, and one four year old there, and it's kind of a drag. Schools do a really great job of gendering kids and giving the kinds of messages that um, deem what is appropriate for girls or boys. Teachers, big, big, and we'll, we'll be looking at just a kind of outdated but really still um, provocative as far as I, I think, uh, little, uh, doc, little video about um, feeling at fairness that, that how uh, female teachers spe specifically, um, and male teachers I'm sure as well, um, really treat girls and boys differently in classroom setting, even when they know that you know, they're kind of maybe favoring boys and they still do it. So it's just amazing that it continues to happen. And so what we do uh, with gender socialization and a lot of times um, in school settings is that, that we, we just turn kids that are pretty much kind of the same. Uh, you know, I mean, there's some biological difference, right? But people are kind of the same. But girls and boys, because of how we want to praise girls for their appearance and they kind of get trussed up in these outfits that are they impede their ability to move and we'll talk about that more um in a rethink pink um article in a, in a lecture that's just mind-blowing as far as i'm concerned that we we change them into something else so that they act differently physically different in classroom settings and it's not to the advantage of girls to, to these differences don't don't help them and you'll see that a lot in the feeling at fairness and 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 again what that kind of underscores is that that teachers specifically work with boys in a different way. Still, I mean, this the, that video I'm talking about, dang, it's so old, it's from the 70s. You know, you all, you're so distracted by the, the hair and the shoulder pads that you almost can't listen to the message. But but look, at we're looking at 2011. We could say uh, this right now, that, that, that boys get more attention. It's part of classroom management. Um, and so what teachers do is they give them more attention, which means they give them better feedback, uh, concise feedback, ask for more um, for, for more from them. 
um, and that's the way it is. So that's like a good deal for boys, but for girls, they're they have been socialized to be less demanding in classroom settings from the get go, and uh, the teachers therefore then have less expectations of girls because they don't have to manage their their noise levels or anything, and so they're not given the kind of concise feedback boys have, are giving. So. Lots of uh, agents of, of gender socialization, right? And media, we know about that. It's a big one. And you're going to be watching a documentary misrepresentation, you know, over 10 years old, but nothing is better out there and just gives you a really per an idea of the persistent socialization of girls and the impact, the negative impact of that. It's, it's really, um, there's some really telling pieces in that. So when we look at the way that media just dominates how girls should be, how females should be, you could give me a, a million examples about how, uh, uh, I mean, how females are over-sexualized in TikTok. I mean, it's gotten a little better, right? And I mean, it just goes on and on and on. the representation of, of males and females in uh, movies. And then we look at f females of color. And I mean, again, the outnumbering of, 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 Males in general, um, when it comes to everything, screen time, leading roles, all of it, is just really uh, disparate. In toys, that's easy for you to see, right? If you go into down toy aisles in any kind of store, Target or something like that, even though now they've non-gendered and they don't have the pink girl aisles and the blue boy aisles, they still got things kind of lumped together where you go. And the deal is that... Um, that toys continue to be highly gendered no matter what kind of representation they want to put on stuff. But boys are still um, more encouraged to play with open-ended, interesting kind of trial and error things like, you know, trucks and machines and, and Legos where you, you build stuff up in blocks and fail and do it over again. So lots of STEM things there. And girls are still considered to uh, want to be playing with this kind of stuff. And who doesn't love a good little kitchen? Um, boys and girls, right? But this is where we market our girls to be. And so not that you don't want to have nurturing, nurturing and caring behavior. We want that for all kids and all adults, to be honest. But there, this is more, this isn't as open-ended play as what boys have. It's, it's kind of a really kind of domesticated, like there's certain things you do. I mean, how many things can you do with an iron, right? A pretend iron. So what we're doing is setting up girls to, to really uh, have... Um, less challenging play and, and, and quite honestly, very sedentary play by virtue of, of the materials they're playing with. So, I mean, this kind of sums it up. So, so boys get to use their imagination in open-ended sort of play a lot more um, robustly than girls do because girls are using their imagination. But again, th th when you're working with things that you can do lots of stuff with, you're going to use your imagination more and you're going to use trial and error. You're going to do all sorts of things. So toys, a big thing. Toys, a big, big thing. So compare this where maybe you could have a little more dramatic play, a little more possibilities to a washer and a dryer and a really weird iron, right? So so it's really tragic that this is, I think, is tragic. And um, I think it's really wrong. So in terms of Legos, that so they've tried to put more girl colors in Legos to encourage girls to play with Legos. But I really like what this uh, little girl, Charlotte, said. She said, Dear Lego Company, my name is Charlotte and... My name is Charlotte. I am seven years old and I love Legos, but I don't like that there are more Lego boy people and barely any Lego girls. Today I went to a store and saw Legos in two sections, the girls pink and the boys blue. All the girls did was sit at home, go to the beach and shop, and they had no jobs, but the boys went on adventures, worked, saved people, and had jobs, even swam with sharks. I want you to make more Lego girl people and let them go on adventures and have fun. Okay? Thank you. From Charlotte. And you, if you were, have ever looked into the world of Legos, you can see that it's quite true that, that boy, air quotes, themes outnumber girl things, and boys are 
themes and boys are marketed more to to the open-ended aspects of Legos versus like the let's be friends sort of Legos where they hardly build anything, right? So they have come up with a few small sets uh, with representation of girls and, and science and some of the STEM things they sell out fast and, and there, there's not much going on with that at all. So th this quote I love and it's just, it's a really sad quote. Studies reveal that three-year-old girls are already highly invested in body image and are eager perpetuators of socially established stereotypes. So three-year-olds already knowing what they're supposed to look like as a girl and that is mostly based on appearance and they're going to they're going to do that so they get that those accolades they get that attention and i think that's just a really horrific way to be valued and they have all sorts of uh of models out there in terms of toys and messages on tv and all sorts of things as to this is how they should be valued just on appearance only I mean, we've, all, we've got s surveys that say that 87% of girls, are they already know that, that women are judged on their appearance. And now we're looking, saying that three-year-old girls are judged on their appearance. And we have studies that show that 80% um, of 10-year-old girls have been on a diet. 80% and they're 10 and they've been on a diet. Crazy, right? Crazy, crazy. That that in the half of girls age six to eight want thinner bodies. Where are the where do they these models come from? They come from from media, right? So I just wanted to do a side note on this slide right here, when I um, had talked about before that sometimes I can't find representation in terms of uh, different uh, colors of people. Right, and this I was looking just for ten-year-old girls. So the the girl on the left could find a million rep, r examples of of a uh, an approximate ten-year-old white girl. Uh, the the Latina in the middle took a little bit longer. Sometimes I could only find them playing soccer. You know, not just just kind of just kind of a standard sort of role here. And um, for uh, black girls, si similar to Latinx, just just want you know kind of reflective across the board 10 year old so uh, it took a long time to put this uh, slide together and that is the case often when I'm looking at trying to be um, reflective and represent um, our society so gender is constructed by culture and society and the amazing thing and we look at that throughout the semester spider girls how about Spider-Woman, right? 